Wake up, Nora! Ah, ah! You have to go to work. I can hear you. Teresa, how are you? Good, how are you? The first thing I kind of want to ask you is, how did you, what was your, where were you, I guess, and, and how did you feel when you found out that season two was being renewed, especially after COVID in 2020 had canceled so many shows? Uh, you know, the first ones to go, unfortunately, are black, brown, ethnic uh, shows. So when you got the word that we're being renewed, what was that like for you? Yeah, we were so ecstatic to be able to come back and do the show again, because like you said, we we don't have this many these many kinds of shows on the air. And so especially working with the amazing cast and kind of you know going through the motions of season one, we kind of figured out how to do it a little bit. You know, we were sort of all doing this a little bit for the first time and kind of getting to know the characters a little bit more and seeing what, you know, what worked and what didn't work. And so it felt really nice to just be able to say, okay, great, we can do it over. We're going to level it up this time and kind of go a little more, you know, like deeper into our, our characters uh, while still keeping obviously the fun of, of season one. Um, are you familiar with Tanya Siracho? I'm not. So she is the Latina showrunner writer. She's like an advocate of the culture. She's like on that Eva Longoria level, but you know, more showrunner, more writer. And she did a show called Vida uh, mm -hmm. that was on Showtime, I believe. And I remember I had a conversation with her maybe about a week, two weeks right before season, her season three was renewed and she was in shambles because she couldn't wait for that second season or that third season uh, to hit. It must have meant a lot to her to get that renewal. For you, what does it mean to have a television show that you executive produced and created on television? Oh, it's crazy. Uh, it's absolutely insane. Just the, there's a lot of it that um, I think in, even when we sort of initially got the green light uh, of just being like, oh my goodness, it's really happening. And then feeling the feeling the weight of the community on your shoulders and everyone really thinking about and looking at this and being like, it's going to be under the microscope because anything like this is. Uh, but then realizing as, as we got into it and as we were just trying to tell the stories of like, all right, we don't, this isn't a burden of, hey, represent the entire community because we're never going to be able to do that. And that's an insane thing. For You've anyone. accepted that. You've accepted, You've accepted that. that. Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, like the d diaspora is large. We can't say we're going to represent everyone. What we can do is say, hey, we want to make a really fun show that we want to watch that is going to like make you laugh out loud and make you embarrassed and make you cringe and make you be like, oh, I can't show this to my parents. That's kind of the show that we were like, OK, we would we would love to make this because we never saw this growing up um, as well. Like we didn't see characters like this growing up. So for sure, there is a lot of pressure on that of when there aren't that many other shows like you of being like, oh God, I hope people like it. And I hope it not only represents the community well, but it also represents us well because we just want to make something that's funny. Uh, and there's definitely, you know, like the added pressure of just being one of the only ones. But I think luckily, even from when we started and we started, um, we shot the pilot in 2018, uh, it's, it's changing um, a lot, you know? So, so being able to see way more TV shows that have Asian American cast, people of color cast, and it, it feels like there's a tide that's shifting, hopefully, mm -hmm. but, you know, a slow moving tide for sure. That's long overdue. So 2018 Aquafina is released to the world and so much has happened in the last three years. What were you guys going for uh, in this particular season? Is it all bubbled up in 2018 uh, and sort of a continuation of our life from that universe? Or are we seeing dynamics change completely uh, in this season? Yeah, so we, uh, so we shot the pilot in 2018, but then we shot the rest of season one in 2019. Uh, so ah. so it actually, and then it aired um, kind of the first uh, month in January, 2020. So we're kind of playing season two as we're starting off as if we were back in 2019, sort of like the winter of 2019. So we're, we're starting off, it's pre-pandemic, so we're not really mentioning the pandemic at all in the first few episodes. Um, 
and kind of just, it was nice to not have to think about that while we were shooting season <laughs> two and think about like, oh my goodness, what, how do we deal with this? Because it was something that at least from my perspective, I just, I didn't want to go back to uh, and didn't want to see, you know, on in the entirety of a TV show, at least. It's interesting because I think a lot of people would have been like, oh my God, we're going to be completely tone deaf if we don't mention what happened in 2020. Maybe we should do some reshoots. Maybe we should get the band back together to kind of, you know, do rewrite a couple of scenes. Was that ever even an idea? Um, yeah, no, we, we actually do kind of address, you know, sort of later on in the season, we do address um, the pandemic and kind of, especially in the timeline of the show happening a few uh, a few sort of months after season one, which was technically in 2019, we do sort of address it, but it was kind of a topic that was discussed of, you know, what do we do? Do we ever, do we just like not have it in our world at all? And I think just because our show, it is such a real show, it's really like authentic to our characters and the world, and especially being an Asian American show, uh, we felt like we, sh you know, had a responsibility of kind of saying, okay, this thing happened um, and not really putting a heavy hand to it uh, at all, but sort of later in the season, there was kind of allusions to, you know, that, that whole life. And you know, that was a, that was a tough decision. I think we had a lot of conversation of like wh whether or not we do it, um, maybe wanting to stay away from it. And there was always kind of the fine balance of, you know, you don't want to, again, we're a comedy, we're trying to make people laugh. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, there are some real issues, you know, that we all went through last year and especially are still going through that need to be addressed. And especially with the platform that we have and being one of the only few Asian American shows out there um, that we felt like we needed to, to hit. So we've been talking to brown, black, uh, Asian directors um, that are comedians or writers or comedians in some way. And they really hate the state of comedy right now. They feel that they can't really even be themselves. Like everybody talks about authenticity and comedy and they feel like comedians are the first ones to go, what authenticity? I'm not allowed to be me. I'm constantly being bludgeoned by anything that I say. Um, and it's starting to affect comedians. So for you, writing comedy in 2021, what is that like? You know, uh, yeah, it's interesting. Um, I feel like weirdly the the stuff that we're writing now, especially because um, we're, we're having this platform, we're able to do it. Like it does feel it, there's, there's an extent of, yes, you don't want to say the wrong thing because then you're going to get canceled. And all of a sudden uh, like your, your whole world's going to end. But at the same time, there's also this nice thing of like, Hey, there are some jokes that were never okay. And I've been in a lot of writer's rooms where like, you just hear things, then you're like, you just have to go with it because it's just comedy. Like that's just a joke, relax. And I think the nice thing about the current environment is that like, there are things that you're just like, I don't think this was ever a joke. It was just kind of more shock value than a joke and kind of mm. redefining what it means to be funny and what, like what comedy is in essence is, and yeah, I, I think there's part of it that's just like, oh my gosh, PC culture, like we can't say these things. That's, that's terrible. But then there's also part of it that's just like, hey, we can all of a sudden show more people who have never gotten this kind of platform at all ever and then there's sort of redefining what it means to be funny. You know, like we don't necessarily have to just go crazy insane and say like offensive things for it to be funny. Cause I've, I've definitely worked on many shows where it was just like, hey, say the most offensive thing and that's a joke. How would you describe the comedy of Aquafina? I feel it's very unique and I have not been able to articulate it. So why not ask the creator? Um, what exactly, how would you describe the humor, not necessarily of just Aquafina, uh, of Nora, but the the humor of the show itself. Yeah, it's it's funny that you say you can't really describe it either because I think there's it's wacky but grounded, and it's um, there are insane elements, but I think it's all very heartfelt in a in a strange way. Like we're raunchy, but we also really like try to be smart, and I think that there we're always there it's we're oxymorons in every single aspect of it because I think there are so so many elements of like for instance in season one you have an episode of her queefing and you think well that's just you know this is like insane um and this is just this kind of like lowbrow humor but at the same time it was like deep down inside you know like we're also 
commenting on the state of like music musicians and like you know women's bodies and kind of like accepting that and being really open to that and so i think there's this kind of nice dichotomy that we try and we mostly go on like the the sort of other end of things of like we just want to make it funny but you know we really try to make it as have a thought behind it that actually is maybe a little bit um makes it a little bit more real and a little bit more okay um for us to just do our normal fart jokes that uh, you might see on any other thing so for you lowbrow comedy versus highbrow comedy who is this comedy for who's the target audience i look at us as a show that some people might say oh i just love watching it i wouldn't but it's not like a guilty pleasure that you love watching i think we're just Mm. trying to kind of be authentic to like who she is and her brand of comedy and you know what she loves and I think that that's the fun thing about you know I feel like there's so many comedies comedies that you watch that are like actually really sad and they're really deep and serious and I'm like yeah those are those are great they're really fun but I'm not like happy watching it and I the the nice thing about the show that I, I I you know obviously I'm incredibly biased but I watch it and I feel happy and I think so much of that is to do with you know Nora and the cast and just people that you want to watch, you root for them, you know, like you, I root for Lori every single day, you know, like just seeing her and seeing her on screen and knowing what she's been through and being able to put her on a TV show and knowing how proud she is and how much she loves the show. It's really, really sweet. And so really proud of that. Teresa, what was your adventure? What was your life's journey like? What was that adventure like from the moment that you decided to become a TV writer to where you are now? It was a really kind of cir- a circuitous path, I think, because um, I started off with the very kind of like Asian oriented mind of let's let's do the thing that like, you know, that is like safe, that makes you money, that your parents would be proud of. And I uh, was basically going to be an investment banker. And I spent a summer at uh, Lehman Brothers in 2006, where I watched, uh, where I worked in this equity research group and putting buy ratings on JP Morgan and Bear Stearns and all these companies that in a year and a half went bankrupt and triggered a $700 billion government bailout. So I was in this kind of like financy path and realized, I was like, I don't like this. This is not something that I like or want to do. And I was working in finance at NBC Universal because I wanted to be near the entertainment business. And I was like writing jokes for the finance newsletter, <laughs> which were, it was like, it was like, well, what am I even doing? What, what is this? This is such a weird thing. And then just kind of decided, hey, I have to take the leap at some point. You can't just like think about doing the thing. You should actually try and do it. And so Um, That was kind of the path where I was writing scripts on the side. I was, you know, doing blogs on the side, but then, you know, kind of getting the scripts in the right right hands of people and then being able to um, work. My my very first job was on on Family Guy. So that was a great kind of. Okay. I mean, what does it take to have that as your first job? I mean, from business to writing on a major television show on broadcast television. Oh yeah, no, and and I don't mean to say it of like, oh, it just like, it was this, and then all of a sudden it happened, it was so easy. It was like years and years of kind of writing on the side and working on the side and just Mm. basically, and I ended up working on a Canadian kids show in the interim where I was, uh, you know, I was writing 20 episodes of television in 12 weeks. And it was just kind of like a weird uh, operation where we were writing in like the attic of a church. Um, And so there were, there, there was definitely like sort of the lean times in between of just, but then I had a script. Um, I had a you know a couple of scripts and ended up basically being able to submit myself, or you know I had an agent at the time who submitted myself to, uh, submitted me to Family Guy, and they were looking for writers. And then that it just in that sort of staffing season time, I got meetings um, at a bunch of places, and they were one of the meetings, and so I was able to be hired on that show. But it was absolutely like you said, it was like you're in single A baseball, and all of a sudden they're like they call you up um, to play in the major leagues, and you're like, oh my god, am I ready for this? Is this real? Uh, it was incredibly lucky, but at the same time, like I don't want to say luck necessarily because I think a lot of people say that, right? They're like, oh, it was lucky, which of course it absolutely was. But there was, you know, like there's an element of like, I had been working for a long time for this. So it ended, it ended up happening to work out. But yeah, it was, it was, a, it was a crazy kind of multi, multi-year process. 
did you feel that your life changed once you got American Dad? Yeah, yeah. You know, um, working on those shows, there were such great, uh, like, areas of just learning. Um, so learning how to write jokes, learning how to be funny, like, on the spot and working with really great people to kind of understand how the process works of how what it takes to create a television show and make a television show mm -hmm. uh, be successful. So it was it was absolutely a life changing kind of kind of thing. When you write for animation, how different is that for writing for real living people, flesh and bones? Was there a transition for you creatively? Uh, did you start noticing nuances that maybe the viewer can't see? Uh, for you, what was that transition like? Or is it is it exactly the same? Oh, no, it's very, it is very different because obviously in animation, you can kind of do whatever you want. You can blow off a character's head. You can send them, shoot them off into space. Uh, you can do whatever. <laughs> um, and there's so many more things you can get away with in animation. Like partly with, uh, with your live action show, there's, um, you know, you're limited by your budget, you're limited by the things you're able to do, um, how it's going to look, there are all these limitations that you have in an animation, it is almost like a blank slate, you can kind of almost do anything, which is daunting, of course, in and of itself. But um, the nice thing about actually moving into that live action space was being able to work with actors and kind of understand, you know, in animation, pretty much the actors come in, they read their lines, and they do the thing. And and, and, and that's, that's a, you know, sort of one aspect of it. And in live action, it's very much like, all right, we're actually working together now of like, you know what, it's not coming out right. And, you know, out of your mouth, because you're actually seeing you say the thing. And so that was definitely kind of a new experience of like, okay, obviously adjusting your, your writing to make it more uh, production friendly to make it more like, oh, actual people are going to be doing this and saying this, like cartoons mm -hmm. can get away with a lot of things, but real life actors, they might say something and it might be all of a sudden, like not funny anymore. And so that was right. definitely an adjustment. So within those times, were you the only Asian that was in the writing room? Uh, on those shows, um, <laughs> it was more, uh, so on Family Guy, we we actually had two Asian women on the show. Um, and I have, I have worked, Cherry, Chiva Prabhat Dumrong, who I um, am got to be very close with and we're writing. We're actually writing a, a movie together, so yes, congratulations with Adele oh, thank Lim. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, yeah it's no, the title at the moment. Yeah, there were not a lot of women uh, in those writers' rooms. I think it's getting better now, which is great um, because you want to see that. Uh, but that was definitely one of the tougher things of just kind of like figuring out. Okay, you know, it, it it's something to say like, oh, it was in the past. You know, like it was years ago. Um, but I think the nice thing about having those experiences was just knowing that like, okay, when I have my own show and my own room, it's going to look different from what I came up in. Now, your mindset has always been a confident person, knowing that you were going to get your show? Um, or... Oh, hell no. no <laughs> oh my God, no. Horrifying. That's... Be because in the, in the show, Aquafina, Aquafina really sort of thinks out loud about her own insecurities and how she's never going to be anybody and she's trying to be somebody, but it's almost like destined. So I'm just wondering, is that some of your own voice somewhere in there? Yeah, I mean, I think all of us, unless you're like a true psychopath, uh, have these kinds of insecurities that creep up all the time. And, you know, especially as a woman too, you're just like always trying to like tamp down those insecurities. Or like the whole, even the whole thing earlier, just being like, don't say you got lucky, you know, be like, you deserve it. That kind of stuff would be like, all right, always trying to be like, hey, remember, you deserve these things. You, th you think thinking about them, you deserve them. Have the confidence of, you know, the, have a confidence of a mediocre white man kind of situation. Right, right. <laughs> even, even if it's like completely undeserved. Um, but no, I mean, I think never, never would have imagined like A, being able to do the show um, and kind of be given the reins to actually make the show that we wanted because we were, you know, we didn't really know what we were doing a little bit. Um, we were kind of just figuring it all out. And part of it really was like, all right, we had an amazing team around us that were like really helpful and mm. kind of figuring out what everything was. We had an amazing writing staff for season one and season two. And it's just all, all of it comes together, you know, like no show obviously is just its cast or just its creators. It's really the whole team. And that was that like they make us all look way better than uh, than we we come off. 
for people, for young women that want to get into this business and they want to become um, showrunners, uh, the position of power um, within the television industry, what is it like to be a showrunner? The best description of showrunning um, that I'm going to steal from uh, the writer Courtney King, who is the showrunner of Doogie, um, the new Doogie reboot on Disney Plus, she said, you know, basically you kind of go into the world as, as a writer, you, you go in as a writer and you're learning how to write. You're learning, especially in, in comedy, you're learning how to do jokes. You're learning like story uh, jokes, everything. You're kind of, you know, production, that, that side of things, but it's really a writing job. And then suddenly you're the showrunner and they're like, Hey, take all those skills that you learned as a writer. And now you're also going to manage a seven 11. And that was <laughs> her sort of quote of what show running is. And that's like, right. exactly, you know, like there's, this element of like you're writing, but then also now you have this management aspect of like, you're managing this whole group of people, um, you're managing actors, you're managing crew, um, and it is a totally different animal. And so I would say it's, there's a different kind of level of creativity that you have to have. Of course, like there's the creative element of like, you wanna make sure the scripts are right and you wanna make sure the writer's room is on track, but then there's also the execution element of like, oh, okay, we need to make sure everyone is happy and everyone's doing their job. And I think, it's, it's amazing. Like it, it absolutely is a job that, um, you know, like, like you said, like young women should like aspire to. I didn't, had no idea that this was ever a thing when I was growing really? up. Really? You know? I was just, I was like, oh, I, I had no idea. I mean, I, I just wasn't in that kind of mindset, I guess. I didn't know, like, I didn't know entertainment and not, none of that. Um, but I always knew kind of was like, I want to do something a little bit different. I want to like, I, I want to be in charge. It's like, this is, the thing like, hey, I think I could be good at this. And I think I, you know, like am learning all the tools to be good at this. And eventually like it, it ends up happening. But yeah, it was it was a long road for sure. Um, and, you know, there's all these little things along the way of just being like, are you good enough? Are you good enough? Though those like insecurities popping in your head, right? And, uh, and yeah, got, like again, just really grateful. Like the whole team, there's like a huge team around us that like really all helps us out. And in terms of like, obviously having the like amazing cast, just kind of, you know, Nora, BD, Lori, Bowen, they're just, you sometimes you just let them run and just let them right. go. And you're just like, okay, we, I know it'll be good just because they're in the scene. How did you end up meeting Aquafina? And what was, was it, like we're besties for the rest of our lives, we're sisters, or was there a period of trying to figure each other out, trusting each other? How did you guys meet? We were uh, actually set up by our agents um, back in 2016, uh, I think. So it was a long time ago. And she had this, you know, she had this deal with Comedy Central. They wanted to make a TV show. And so she was looking for writers. And to her credit, she wanted to find female Asian writers um, and so we met, we kind of clicked right away and we went through a lot of different iterations of the show. We weren't really sure exactly what it was going to be like in the beginning. It was sort of more like, oh, it's kind of a millennial show with her friends. And then just getting to know her a little bit better and seeing how close she was with her family and seeing like how much love there was there. It felt like, all right, you know what, this is really a show that's going to be about your family and, you know, a little bit more autobiographical than it was in the beginning. And yeah, absolutely. Like, uh, I think from then until now, it's like we met each other like purely professional and now like we're really close. She's, she's the, the great thing about her. She is a really great person. She has a great heart. She's a true professional. And it's always a pleasure working with someone like that because you know she has this like aura and personality sometimes where you're like, oh, that like, she, she might just be like a stony, stonery, like spacey person, but it's like, no, she's she's locked in and she's really smart and she's super fun to work with. Tell me about Bowen Yang. Um, he's had a meteoric rise as of late and, you know, not every, everybody's sort of catching up with Bowen. What's so special about Bowen from your point of view? Yeah. So it's so funny because we actually, um, we cast Bowen uh, before he was even on SNL. We actually learned he was going to be a writer on SNL on the show. Um, and also we found out he got the call that he was going to become a cast member while he was on set with us. And so, you know, it's crazy because it really was, you're just watching a lot of auditions for Edmund and we had in our minds, it was a totally different type of character. It was kind of more this like really douchey bro-y kind of guy. 
<laughs> Bowen came on and just made us laugh. And we were like, actually, this is, he's the guy. Like we were going to rewrite the character to fit him because wow. it's not, you know, it's, it's no longer this like total bro. It's going to be this guy who's like, and, and well, the great thing, amazing thing about Bowen that he's able to bring out is just like, he's got this, like, he's kind of a jerk to Nora, but at the same time, you can sense this vulnerability in him that it's like coming from a really deep emotional place. And he's, again, I, I can't speak more like about our cast who they're just all really, really great. And just like being able to finally like have a show that they're, they're all like really excited about. Like, I, I think especially like Lori and BD, they like really haven't been able to kind of just like be on a show where they're more than one Asian person and then being able to have like the freedom to kind of play as they do, it's it's been fun. So one of the legends, I mean, and, and there's many of them, but Margaret Cho is doing a guest appearance at the season. Uh, tell me a little bit about that moment of having Margaret come into your show. I'm sure you watched her, you know, in her original show years ago and what she represents to uh, age, the Asian community in terms of the Hollywood system. What was it like to have her there and what did she bring and what any stories that you could tell and share? Oh my gosh, she's she's amazing. Absolutely amazing. Um, and yeah, I, I grew up, you know, watching her and being like, wow, again, not not a lot of faces that you see and you remember every single one. Anytime you see something, you're like, whoa, that's crazy. Truly groundbreaking. And yeah, she has a couple, uh, she's a two episode arc um, with us at the end of the season. Um, and she just plays this kind of zany character. Uh, and she was just, it was really, really, it, it, it felt like it kind of came full circle of just like the OG, you know, Margaret Cho. And again, we've had, there's so many OGs, you know, Lori, basically, BD, you know, like they're, they've all kind of paved the way for us to do what we are able to do on this show. It's like, like, if, without them, the people, people really wouldn't be, you know, like we wouldn't have been able to have this like opportunity to do this. So uh, it was really, it was really cool having, having her on set. I had a chance to talk to Randall Park uh, a few months ago, and um, you know, at the time he was he's creating a a production company to tell uh, Asian stories, and I think he had sold one or two shows, or he was in the process of that. And one of the big problems, uh, at least for me, has been in the Latino community: the lack of programming. Teresa, we are getting our shows; all our shows are being canceled. Like we are being fully erased from broadcast. We're being erased from cable. There's really not much, you know, in the streaming universe. So I had asked Randall, I go, Randall, what kind of advice can you give us? What really gets a show, you know, at least even in development, let alone, you know, uh, a pilot greenlit or whatever is, is the package. What stars do you bring? Uh, to that package, you know, along with that idea? What what famous director do you attach? How would you describe to us how we can get in? How can Latino stories get in the way Asian stories are breaking through? Like, In the Heights was supposed to be the crazy rich Asians. That's the way it was molded. That's the way it was framed. Uh, uh, John Chu directed In the Heights. It didn't work out, but it worked out for the Asian community. And we're going... What do we have to do? What do we have to do to get sort of just a bit of a recognition? So from your perspective, you're successful. You guys have made it. You have your own show. It's in its second season. You're about to do a movie. What can Latino creators, writers do to break through into Hollywood from your perspective? Gosh, I, the, the crazy thing for me is it's, it's not anything that you guys have to do. It's really the system has to change. Mm. And I, like, that's an insane thing. I mean, the, I feel like in the Heights, which is a great movie. And the, the, the hard thing was I saw it at, in my house, you know, it's like, I didn't get to see it in theaters. And then, of course that's sort of a casualty of the pandemic, but not yeah. having, like, I think crazy rich ages really opened the door for us. It was such a sort of groundbreaking watershed moment of, the executives and all the people in charge with the with the purse strings, they said, oh, wait, Asian people will come out for this. Um, and that was really showcasing that. And I think a lot of like, for instance, our show, we got greenlit after the success of Crazy Rich Asians. And I think a lot of other shows in the same sort of way of just people thinking, okay, great, they'll come out for this. We know it's an entity because no, 
like they don't want to like spend the money without having that like proof. And that's, that's the tough thing of just having, unfortunately within the Heights, it felt like if that had gone out and done gangbusters, but because of, you know, the weird uh, release of it, that was a really tough thing that it just couldn't be like a huge, huge hit. And so for me, I, I don't want to say like, it's anything that the creators have to do. It's like the content is out there. Like we are all doing it. We're all making it. And it's just the studios that have to, you know, basically take chances on things and be able to say, Hey, I want to make this because it's an authentic story and, and actually make it happen. Because I think they all say they want to do it, but then it's very rare when it actually happens. Um, and that's a, I mean, it's, it is truly insane why we can't have more content. You know, you have like 80 shows out there that are all like, Hey, here's the, the same three guys, two guys, whatever, doing the same thing. And it's just because they have a track record It's because they have the experience because again, the, the people in the past that have the experience, they all get to make their own shows, but we don't ever get the experience. Like a handful of us ever get the experience and so they have to take chances on on people like us because it's and and it's like it's not like I, I feel like we we are doing it we're doing the thing it's just like people I mean unless we we get all the billions of dollars and we're able to take chances on our own um unfortunately that's I, I think that's just kind of weirdly how the system is right now which is a huge bummer so you went from banking to writing for animation, to writing for your own show that you show run, and now you're catapulting over to film, uh, which is the king of all mediums. Um, what has this time been like for you? Um, how are you mentally prepared for this next chapter uh, of your profession? What kind of stories do you wanna tell? And can you tell us a little bit about the project that you're doing with Adele? In, in terms of the sort of next, thing is just like yeah we want to be able to tell more stories featuring um asian american characters that you haven't seen before we want to sort of stories that we would have wanted to see growing up and um you know this movie has been kind of a labor of love for for the past few years between uh, me and cherry who wrote the movie and then adele who also like we would just go into adele's house and kind of like storyboard things you know like put up put up post uh put up uh, post-it notes on a board and kind of figure out what this movie was and just we wanted to make it r-rated and raunchy and something that's super fun and embarrassing that our parents would blush at and i i think that that will hopefully will be the case um i don't think i will watch it with my parents um <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah it's 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 really it has really been a blessing but it is kind of just like you said like a lucky way that sort of happened because of the success of one thing that was like okay hey this can usher in a bunch of things and it's crazy because last year during TCAs someone actually someone actually asked uh, a reporter asked me the question of like hey um do you think it's a trend of like asian american things and i'm like gosh I mean, we're, we're, we're like, we've been around. We're not like, a, we're not going anywhere. Like a trend right. is like low bottom, <laughs> low bottom jeans or whatever, you know, like uh, high waisted jeans. Like we're not, we're, we're still here. Um, so I think it's kind of the same thing of just like things get hot and then they'll like ride the wave. And then I don't know. Right. And we're just hoping we're like, okay, well this, it's not just a wave. Like hopefully it'll like kind of stay, stay up here. So wanted to get to see if you can um, give us some personal recommendations of any TV shows that you've been watching, any books that you've been reading. Book recommendation um, is Minor Feelings by Kathy Park Hong. It's uh, just a really, it's, it's I, I think the sort of um, subtitle of the book is like an Asian American reckoning. And there are so many, it's, um, you know, Kathy Park Hong, she's a poet, but she writes this really lyrical, like, memoir-esque kind of um, book that's that's all about kind of her experiences experiences being Asian American and the sort of minor feelings of like the microaggressions that sort of happen along your life that kind of build up, that build up over time. And then you start realizing you're like, oh, this, these are something things that we think about that other people don't have to think about necessarily. Um, and so that was a really, that was like an amazing read that it's, you know, reading one of those books that you're like, oh my gosh, this is totally my life right now. Uh, I'm really feeling this is like horrifying. Um, it's like she sees me in a way. Um, so that that's wow. that's my like definite recommendation of uh, 
uh, of reading of, of, of that book for sure. 